He is the creative director of the foundation. He is the editor of the new book that is released today. And he is the curator of the Al Hirschfeld exhibit at the Museum of Broadway. David, how did you get involved with this? Well, I'm very much like you. I grew up looking for Nina's in Hirschfeld's work. I grew up in central Pennsylvania and uh, nothing ever happened there. But on Sunday morning, the New York Times was delivered. And once my parents initiated me into the world of looking for Nina's, uh, I was one of five children. So we raced to see who could get the paper first. And uh, I looked at the drawings for years without really knowing what they were. And one day I said, oh, my God, who are these people and what are they doing? And that started me on a completely different journey. Um, I was doing research on a uh, a peer of Hirschfeld's, uh, an artist by the name of Ben Soloway, um, who did drawings of theater performers for the New York Times and the Herald Tribune in the in the 1930s. And I noticed frequently that his drawings appeared next to Al's in those papers. And so, you know, light bulb went off and said, I should contact Hirschfeld. I looked him up in the phone book and he was there, but I was too shy to give him a call. Um, I didn't think you would actually reach Al Hirschfeld. Uh, so I wrote him a letter and uh, he wrote back probably the warmest letter I've ever received from somebody who's not my family. Uh, and he invited me the next time I was in Fun City to come up and quaff some tea and so I did that and we hit it off. And I was very proud of myself when I left there, having hit it off with Al Hirschfeld. Um, I later came to realize that he hit it off with everybody because he was just a very nice guy. Uh, and then right after that, I was asked to organize the archive of his work because it turned out that while Hirschfeld had this fascinating life uh, and history, he had no interest in it. He lived completely in the present. And uh, he was, people was, were always asking him about the past. So when he would get asked about the past, he would say, oh, you'll have to talk to my archivist. He's put everything in order and now I can't find anything. <laughs> we, that's how it all started. And I would visit him in his studio at least once a week. And I did that for 13 years. Wow. And cataloged everything that he did. You know, he was not a, he was a great raconteur but the thing he was least interested in talking about was himself. Um, but in the studio, when I would find things, I would say, what is this? Or how does this fit in? And, you know, sometimes he would just answer me while he was drawing because he was always drawing. But sometimes I think when I dislodged a memory, uh, he would sit back in his barber chair and tell a funny little story, chuckle, and then go back to drawing. And we ended up having this vocabulary that only he and I shared about his work, you know, because he remembered everything that he had drawn. And I have a very good visual memory. So we could reference some drawing from 1933. Uh, and we didn't need to see it because we both knew what it looked like. Or he said, I've done something like this. And I would say, oh, yeah, you did it in 1957. It's, you know, it's in this cabinet. You can find it there. You know, uh, and so it was a it was a very warm relationship. Uh, uh, you know, I hold the record for the most free lunches at the home of Al Hirschfeld. Uh, <laughs> and while in the studio we talked about art, uh, around the lunch table we would talk about what shows we had seen, what was going on. As I said, he lived in the present, uh, and you know, we talked about it like anybody. You know, two friends talking about the theater. Um, I see a lot of theater. He, of course, he saw, there's nobody who saw more opening nights on Broadway and Broadway history than, than Al Hirschfeld. Um, and what was always amazing to me is, I, I one time uh, it, uh, there was a 1994 production of Showboat, uh, the last revival of Showboat while he was alive. He had seen five at that point, five Broadway revivals of Showboat. And I remember having lunch the day after the opening. And of course I said, well, how was it? And I don't know why, but I kind of expected him to say, well, it was good, but you know, it wasn't as good as 46 and 32. And, you know, he didn't think that way at all. He, he didn't, he, he saw it completely in what was happening in today's theater. And I think that's how you stay completely active and engaged for, you know, more than 75 years doing what you do, because he didn't look to the past and think it was better. 
he saw everything in the present and and um was as interested in that as anything he had seen of all the shows that he illustrated did he have a favorite oh uh yeah the favorite was the one that he was drawing at that moment um you can go through the new book which has it has more theater drawings than any book that's ever been published uh, uh, of Hirschfeld's work and you can see that every drawing whether the show is a big hit or a big flop he was giving it his all because he was not you and I think about the subject of the drawing and of course he did too he knew it had to look like the performer or the production because that's what the editor wanted and that's what the readers wanted but he was interested in creating a great drawing one that he said could stand on its own two feet could withstand the topical news value of what it was and so his it, he didn't have favorites because they were all subjects to draw you know i guess maybe uh, matisse had favorite models or cezanne had favorite models but when we look at their work, that's not what we look at it for. We look at for what they do. So, so how do you choose what goes into the book and what went into the museum? Well, um, I always say curating is not what you put in, but it's what you leave out. Um, with the book, I knew that we had an opportunity to show about 50, 60, sometimes as many as 70 pieces for many decade. Um, we looked at all of his drawings. Of course, we felt that some of the historic shows had to be represented. You know, you can't talk about the 80s without talking about Phantom of the Opera and Les Mis um, any more than you can talk about the 60s without Feather on the Roof and uh, Funny Girl and Hello, Dolly. Um, there. So what we try to do is find the drawings that we felt had to be in there. And then we also looked at drawings that were great drawings, even if the show was not. You know, there's a great drawing of Mickey Grant's It's So Nice to be Civilized. Mm. Now, the show had a very short run, but the drawing is one for the ages. And and we see that repeatedly throughout the book. Um, really great drawings, uh, no matter what the show is. Because you have to remember that Al's drawings appeared the Sunday before the show opened on Broadway. He didn't know whether it was going to be a hit or a flop. You know, when he drew Feather on the Roof, it was just a show. Uh, and the fact that it turned into a big hit, that's great, but it didn't affect his drawing. He was not there. He wasn't functioning as a critic. He was he was a visual journalist who used um, pictures rather than words. What is the difference of curating for the museum and editing the book? Hmm. The difference is in the museum, you have a lot less room. There are 23 pieces on the wall in the museum, and that covers his entire career. From uh, It covers from 1929 to 2002. So it's not, there's three, three years that are not there, 26 to uh, 29. But uh, for the most part, there's a drawing from every decade in his career. Um, we tried to find drawings, again, that spoke to people um, that were uh, of important figures the first drawing in the show is of Patsy Kelly and audiences today might not know who Patsy Kelly is but any of us of a certain age will uh, remember her return to Broadway in the 70s and when she won a Tony and no 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 net um, but of course with Al these drawings go back to the 1920s when she first appeared on Broadway so we got to be able to tell that story uh, we have a wonderful drawing of the original production of The King and I and we only have that in the show because that was recently discovered. Um, uh, a fellow called us up from Salem, Oregon to uh, tell us that he had the drawing. And when I realized it was the original, I said, well, how do you have it? And he told me about his father finding it in a thrift shop in 1962 for $9.75. Wow. Yeah, it was a, a, an incredible story. Um, and then we have... You know, we we have done these uh, very small edition prints with um, Broadway Cares to raise money for Broadway uh, this Cares. This is the auction. I wanted to get into yeah. that. Yeah. So we have a couple of those prints in the exhibition. We have Sunday in the Park with George. Now, these prints are, are legitimate Hirschfeld prints 
Uh, and of course, Hirschfeld can't sign them, but the performers who were in them signed them. So in the uh, exhibition, we have Sunday on the Park with George signed by Bernadette Peters and Mandy Patinkin. We've got portraits of Liza Minnelli and Julie Andrews signed by them, and one signed by Stephen Sondheim. And that is only an addition of four. Wow. Uh, Sondheim, by the way, uh, Hirschfeld drew Sondheim's whole career, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and he'd already been working for 30 years before Sondheim got started. And yet he drew a half century of uh, Sondheim's career. And Sondheim was a big fan of Hirschfeld's work, you know, uh, and he acquired uh, a number of drawings. Um, Hal Prince bought him a number of drawings. And in, in fact, Sondheim bought some drawings for some of his other collaborators, like Hugh Wheeler and the Little Night Music. Um, the last interview that uh, Sondheim did, uh, the picture with the interview shows him talking in front of a Hirschfeld drawing of putting it together. Wait, if I'm not mistaken, isn't he Hirschfeld draw, drew, draw, however you say that, um, on an album cover? Oh, sure. Well, Hirschfeld's drawings have appeared in many album covers. There's, in fact, some used record stores that have a Hirschfeld album cover section. Um, for Sondheim, the drawing that uh, uh, that comes to mind that was on the album covers, Merrily We Roll Along. Uh, his uh, drawing that appeared in the New York Times was also the cover of the album. In the book, though, we have the original drawing he did of that show with the original cast and the lead character was was changed just days before that show right. opened and Hirschfeld ended he didn't do a new drawing he did a new he did a drawing of the the new actor's head and he glued it onto the drawing <laughs> and so uh the the first time that anybody's ever seeing the original drawing is in this book wow what was the first illustration he did? The first, well, his you're talking about the first caricature, the first theatrical character. Yes. Um, so that was December 26, 1926. It was of the French actor Sacha Guitry, who was making his American debut in his own musical comedy about uh, Mozart. And Al had not intended to do it. He had... He was living in Paris at the time, and he would come back to New York, as he said, to add to his collection of contemporary money with assignments primarily from film studios because he had actually been working in the film industry since 1920. And while he was in New York, he ran into a friend of his, uh, Richard Maney, who was a Broadway press agent who, who was starting his own firm. And he, he invited Al to come see the show. And Hirschfeld being Hirschfeld, he, uh, you know, he couldn't stop himself from drawing and he doodled a likeness of Guitry on his program. And when Maney saw it, he said, you know, Al, if you put that on a clean sheet of paper, I can get one of the papers to run it. And sure enough, uh, the following Sunday, the New York Herald Tribune uh, ran a six column wide drawing uh, above the fold on the front page of the drama section. And that was the start of 20 years of assignments he got from the Herald Tribune. It wouldn't be until January 9th. 1928 that he did his first drawing for the New York Times and he would appear then uh, on average every other week in the New York Times for the next 75 years. What was his last drawing? His last drawing, last last drawing was Tommy Toon in a show called White Ties and Tales. Um, it appeared in December 2002 and in a way, it's a perfect uh, drawing uh, for Hirschfeld because Jules Pfeiffer called Al the, the Fred Astaire of the caricature because he always made it look easy. You know, like Fred Astaire did all those wonderful dances and you, you never saw him break a sweat. And Tommy Toon is like that. He does all this incredible movement and it makes it look like it's the easiest thing in the world. So he captured uh, Tommy's casual elegance as well as his own. And that's in the book. He also drew for other mediums. Did he have oh, yeah. a favorite medium in which it was kind of like his guilty pleasure to go illustrate? Uh, no, it the drawing was was his pleasure. You know, he we call, you know I often refer to it as his work 
but he didn't see it that way. He thought the only time he ever worked was in his garden. Um, he loved to draw and it, he couldn't stop himself from doing it. And where it appeared, you know, when he started uh, working for newspapers, he spent a lot of time trying to get the drawings the same size as they might appear in the paper because he thought he'd get better fidelity in reproduction. And then he came to the conclusion that that was the engraver's art, not his. And so he started working on a much bigger uh, size board. Um, but whether it was going to appear in a newspaper, a magazine, a book, uh, a record cover, anything, that, that, was, that didn't mean that much to him. It was the drawing that was the thing that was so important to him. In curating for the Museum of Broadway, mm -hmm. what shows for you were the most significant to be seen? Um, throughout the whole museum or in the Hirschfeld exhibition? In the Hirschfeld exhibition. Gosh, what shows? Uh, well, I have a very strong attachment to a lot of the shows and, and people in the exhibition. Uh, um, we have a great drawing of a Yip Harburg Howard Arlen musical called Bloomer Girl. Oh, yeah. In which Al has collaged this, this doily as uh, Celeste Holmes dress. I just happen to love that. But we also have a wonderful print of Kiss of the Spider Woman with Cheetah Rivera. Um, I love the portraits of Liza and Julie Andrews because it's so much that like them. There's a wonderful drawing of Blythe Spirit. You know, we have a, we, there's a section of the show that says, you know, Hirschfeld knew that great theater didn't just happen on Broadway. And there is uh, this wonderful image of summer theaters uh, between 1935 and 1958. Um, the one thing readers of New York newspapers could count on is that there was going to be a Hirschfeld drawing heralding the summer theater season. And every year he did it a little bit differently. Well, this one from 1936 shows the Eastern seaboard as made up uh, 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 in a collage of train schedules. Excuse me. And it goes to the heart of what he did with summer theaters. Um, so I love that piece as well. We have two walls of uh, uh, posters. You know, Hirschfeld drew more posters for Broadway shows than any other artist. And oh, those are fascinating that. to look at. What what posters did he do? Uh, My Fair Lady. It, it, oh, maybe you've yeah. heard of that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that is. Uh, and, you know, the funny thing about My Fair Lady is that Al stayed up till four in the morning one night. Uh, to um, to try to convince Moss Hart that you could not improve Pygmalion with songs and dances, that that was just complete folly and that he shouldn't get involved. Moss Hart, of course, directed the original production. Um, luckily for all of us, Moss Hart did not listen to Al Hirschfeld. And the producers came to Al because he had been drawing uh, show posters since uh, the 30s. And... Uh, he created this image, which became uh, one of the most uh, recognizable pieces of theater iconography of the 20th century. And, you know, when there are still productions of My Fair Lady that use the Hirschfeld drawing of it, because originally it was of Rex Harrison and Julie Andrews, but he would do a generic version. And that that drawing is still used in productions all over the world. Well, so, I mean, it just... Uh, the last one he did was for Having Our Say about uh, the two Black sisters uh, and looking back over their lives. Um, the great one of Bell Book and Candle where he's got uh, the cat, Peewack, um, takes a ball of yarn and uh, makes the profiles of Rex Harrison and um, oh, what is his wife's name? Lily Palmer. Uh, it, in the, I mean, it looks just like them, even though it's just a line wow. made out of yarn. And it's they're they're great posters, and you'll be fascinated when you see them. We have album covers, uh, as I said in the uh, exhibition. Um, we have souvenir programs because he used all those things. You know, for most of his seventy six year career drawing the theater, it was hard not to see his drawings. They were everywhere, whether they were in the newspaper magazines, programs, posters, album covers, you know, in anything.
I am so privileged to talk to you today because today is the opening of the Museum of Broadway. And wow. today you can go on to Amazon.com and get the book, the new Al Hirschfeld book. And look for the auction for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS. David, That's actually coming up right now. You will have only a couple more days to bid on those pieces. And you can buy the book at alhirschfeldfoundationshop.org as well. Thank you so much for being with us. We're out of time. Sure. Uh